All right. Um, thank you for the invitation to uh, to, to uh, speak at this meeting. And um, I guess I'm going to start a little bit with a, an overview just on manure management and water quality. And I'm from Ontario, Canada. And although we're a different country, farming practices I've discovered aren't really that different. And probably the biggest difference between between Ontario and um, Ohio is maybe the size of the biggest operations and and that most of our manure storages are not lagoons. Uh, we probably have more cement storages than, than we do lagoons. Um, so kind of as an overview, I'm going to look at how water quality and manure are related, water quality and, and soil health are related, and then look at some of the practices that go into the planning of manure management so that it's not just to oh, the tanks full, we've got to get rid of the manure, uh, where are we going to put it? Instead, looking at a, a way of planning for manure application all through the year and, and looking at opportunities and maybe looking at some changes in crop rotation to take advantage of some of those potential opportunities. So nutrient management and 4R practices, and for, for those of you that aren't familiar with 4R, it's uh, the right rate, right, um, right source, right place, and right time, probably not in that order, but uh, it, it's basically the same thing as nutrient management. And, and so I guess if we look at doing those kind of practices, that will be the biggest method of preventing contamination of water sources. And so to prevent those nutrients from contamin contaminating water sources, I think soil health is a really important part of of uh, having good water quality. Um, the practice of putting on manure or organic amendments in, in combination with cover crops, having a good crop rotation and, and um, taking advantage of the timing of some of those crops in the rotation, but also as a way of improving that soil health so that at the same time we're improving infiltration and water holding capacity and nutrient cycling and all those good things that the soil do for us. Um, and then also part of it is knowing the value of manure. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on analysis, but but if, if we don't take an analysis and we don't know what the, the nutrient content of the manure is, it's really hard to value that manure. So in Ontario, um, our soil quality has, has decreased over the years. And from the labs, we, we got some records of soil samples that included organic matter that were taken from 2002 to 2018. And so this blue line is all Ontario. So it's, it's something like 40,000 samples. Uh, oops, I didn't mean to do that. And, and it shows the decline in soil organic matter over that 15, 16 year period. And then I took the three counties that are probably the highest, or probably the most similar to Ohio in, in both topography and soil type. They're, they tend to be a heavy clay soil um, and they tend to be fairly flat. They tend to have very little livestock, but a lot of corn, soybeans, and, and especially soybeans in the rotation. And so over that same period of time, you can see the decline in that soil organic matter. And it's almost, it's about three quarters of a percent, which is a huge decrease in water holding capacity and in, in, in just soil carbon. So soil quality is directly related to the water quality. If we've got in, uh, decreasing organic matter and we've got a decrease in diverse rotations, so in other words, a lot of corn, soybean or soybean, soybean rotations, We've got an increase in field size and equipment size. We've got increased soil compaction. All of those together increase the amount of soil erosion that we have, increase the amount of nutrient runoff, also increase the amount of compaction and decrease water infiltration. And in Ontario, we've got over 75% of the row crop fields would have tile drainage. And recent, in recent years, that tile drainage has mostly been putting new tile in between the old tile. So uh, if 40 feet spacing wasn't enough, now it's 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 starting to be more like 20 feet spacing. So it, it, it's obviously a problem in in that infiltration and and if we've got poor infiltration and compacted soils, then we've got a higher risk of reduced water quality. This is just a couple of pictures that show soil and nutrient movement in 
the part of Ontario that I live in. This bottom picture, uh, it's a field that had a lot of residue, a lot of corn residue. We had a two inch storm go through and that was the residue after the storm. This is um, pictures taken just recently, uh, actually not this year, but I've got some that were taken just yesterday. Manure applied in the winter. I don't know if that's the problem in Ohio. It shouldn't be a problem here after the nice weather we had over the past year and the opportunities we had for manure application. But yet every year there's farms that, that apply some manure in the winter. And this is, this is a big problem because most in Ontario, and I'm, I'm assuming the same in Ohio, most of the phosphorus loss and nitrogen loss too occurs over the non-growing season period. So there's an increased risk for phosphorus loss from November to April in Ontario. There's often a lot of intense rainfall during this period when there's very little uh, protection in the soil from crops or from canopy or from even from residue in a lot of cases. And so in the past couple of years where they've done the monitoring, over 80% of that phosphorus loss is, is, is occurring during that period of time. And you'll see in this graph that, that nitrate is, we don't talk about it as much, but nitrate loss is also pretty big in the non-growing season. And in three different watersheds in, in Ontario, it shows the, they've done the studies on how much total phosphorus is lost and how much is lost from runoff versus from tile. And the, uh, the surface is the dark blue, the tile is the light blue. And it really depends on what is the topography. So if you've got the area that's most like Ohio where it's flat, heavy clay soils, we've got a lot that's going through tile and surface, surface application um, or surface runoff, I mean. But in these two watersheds, you've got a lot more topography so there's more that's in surface runoff and, and less that goes through the tile. You can see that the standards in Ontario for surface water quality for phosphorus is 30 parts per billion or 0 0.03 milligrams per liter. Um, and you can see that it doesn't matter what watershed we're in, we've, we've exceeded that for total phosphorus um, and even for, for dissolved phosphorus in some of those cases. And this is just, this, this comes from our nutrient management, um, best management practices, but we look at loading limits and we look at loading limits during, during the, the whole year. And the way that loading limits are determined are by looking at what is the slope in, in a field and the slope, especially close to the water course. And then what is the infiltration or the, the drainage class or the hydrologic soil group. Um, and depending on if it's a sand, which would be rapid, or if it's the heavy clay, that impacts what the runoff potential will be. And then once we've got that runoff potential, then we look at what is the runoff potential? Is it being uh, incorporated right away or surface applied? And that gives an indication of what is the maximum application rate before you can start to, to see some runoff. And the point that I thought I would make with, with this slide is if we've got frozen conditions, then it doesn't really matter what our, what our uh, drainage class or hydrologic soil group is. Every soil, if there's no infiltration, would be in a high runoff potential. And a high runoff potential is basically equal to five millimeters of rain or, or in a imperial 0.2 inches of rain. So it's not a lot of, of application or solid manure even with rainfall afterwards to start moving some of those nutrients. Um, this picture, this was one that was taken yesterday of application, um, and hopefully, hopefully we don't see a lot of that this year. The other one that's big in Ontario, and because we've got so much tile drainage, is preferential flow. This picture at the top is a study that we did where we intercepted tiles and we did different forms of application. And in the worst case scenario where it was injected without breaking the macropore ahead of it, it took seven minutes for the manure to get into that tile drain. And what's happening is if we've got, uh, if we've got earthworm channels or, or root channels, and if we've pre-tilled or broken that macropore so that it's not a direct connection to the surface like it is in this one, then we, if we apply manure, if we've done that pre-tillage, we don't have that same risk of that manure getting 
to the tile drain through preferential flow. And that's a big one in Ontario. That's, that's uh, every year we get issues with preferential flow. So that's the issue. How can we do manure management so that we protect our water sources by applying those nutrients at the right time, in the right place, and at the right rate? And so one of the questions is, if can for our nutrient management fit into manure management? And of course, the answer is yes. But some of the questions that we need to ask, especially for those livestock operations, is how much manure is produced, how much storage is available. And for Ontario, the minimum is 240 days, um, basically to cover the winter period. How many acres will the manure be applied to? Because you can have all the land base you want, but if it's only applied to the 50 acres closest to the barn, that's not really a solution. What is the crop rotation? And where are the opportunities in that crop rotation to apply manure? at a time when, when you've got good growing season conditions or at least not winter conditions? And then what is the timing of that application? And so at the, at the end of the day, if we do better planning, it means we'll find more opportunities to apply manure more often during the cropping season. So most, most fields with a nutrient management plan, assuming that they're not extremely high in soil uh, fertility level, are still gonna need some commercial fertilizer. If we apply manure for phosphorus to a corn crop, we aren't gonna have enough uh, nitrogen, so there will still be some, nitro some commercial nitrogen required. Um, the other thing, most nutrient manage con management consultants don't share the information with retail, so there's a disconnect between uh, the retail and uh, the farm in what nutrients are already being applied through manure. So I think there could be a bigger role in for our retail in collaborating with nutrient management consultants or farms that have nutrient management plans so that that livestock manure plays a bigger part in, in that planning process. Um, for our retail can provide additional services to livestock farms that can improve manure management. And some of that's in, in the record keeping and some of it's in, in uh, just asking some of the questions and having access to, to some of the, uh, the information that might not be readily available, um, mapping, that kind of thing. Um, and for Ontario, at least, all farms, if they were being under that 4R um, nutrient, nutrient management, if, if all farms were treated the same and had the same rules, I think it would mean, um, better understanding, better uh, idea of what's allowed and what's not allowed, and, and probably improve the water quality across the province. And it also means positive messaging for sustainability platforms. And so the, I'm not gonna spend any time on these slides except to say that in that for our certification uh, standards where they're doing the audits, they've figured in for the application standards how to work in some of the, the uh, factors that are already in place for the nutrient management um, regulations and, and standards. And so one of them is the phosphorus assessment. So for example, if um, application has to be done through surface application, then the, for our audits need to know that, that uh, phosphorus loss isn't a high risk. And so there's a phosphorus risk assessment tool. Um, and in our nutrient management software, we have just put in a phosphorus loss assessment tool for Ontario. It's like a phosphorus index, and it takes into account erosion, soil test, crop type, hydrologic soil group or drainage class, basically. Um, some of the BMPs that are happening, local precipitation, is there tiling? What is the average tile spacing? What is the application method? What is the application timing? What is the application rate? And those all get to put together to give us a Plato index. And that Plato index, instead of giving a number that's associated with, with a risk, um, it's been put into a color code. And in the nutrient management, that color code comes up automatically so that if somebody sees it's red, they can go and look at where are there some opportunities for, uh, for improvement. The, uh, the phosphorus index is broken up into two, two components. One is the field characteristic or the inherent index, things that you can't really change like slope or like soil type, soil texture. And then the other one is all based on application either from fertilizer or from manure. 
So we look at for the field characteristics or the inherent phosphorus loss, particulate from the surface, particulate from the subsurface or from the tile, dissolved from the surface and dissolved phosphorus from, from tile. And then we do the same thing for, for the application, for the, the manure or for the fertilizer. Those get put together to give a, uh, a, a total phosphorus loss assessment. And so that's part of our nutrient management, um, nutrient management software that's available to farms. And then the record keeping is another one. Record keeping where manure is included, um, the analysis is an important part of it, uh, sets setbacks to sensitive areas or to water sources. Um, sensitive areas are documented, are, um, so not just the nutrient recommendations, but, but it's also mapped. And then all nutrients are accounted for, including the nitrogen credits from legumes, manure, biosolids, organic amendments, whatever. So I mentioned that, that we have software in Ontario and this software, it's based on Ontario recommendations, but there's um, aspects of it that would probably work for anybody. It's available for phone, tablet, computer, English, French, sorry, no Spanish, metric, imperial and, and US gallons. So it includes the crop nutrient calculator, which basically just looks at MPK needs and uh, crop nutrient removal based on location, soil test, previous crop and yield. The organic amendment calculator or the manure calculator looks at available NPK and economic value, um, and then the micronutrients that are applied if they're included in, in the um, test numbers um, from manure or from organic amendments. Fertilizer just gives, uh, you can blend fertilizer sources to achieve target fertilizer rates. The Play-Doh, it's just looking at the different phosphorus management uh, risk losses or losses based on, on management practices. And then all of these get combined that you can do a field management plan so that you can put all of it together. And so that's something that's new for, for our farmers. It, the uh, consultants use that software in a more complicated form. We've tried to put it together in, in simple tools so that farmers can use them and can access them pretty easily. So all of this, putting it all together, how do we on the farm look at preventing nitrogen and phosphorus loss using those 4R uh, management standards? And year-round planning, I've already mentioned, if where can manure fit into the, to the management on my farm? Can I maximize the crop rotation for manure application opportunities? So looking at things, at least in Ontario, at spring application on wheat fields, especially the fields that are flat that don't have a lot of water movement, application into growing crops, so into corn, onto forages after each cut potentially, or pastures after the, the uh, animals go off. This is the biggest one in our area after wheat harvest with cover crops. Um, a lot of people, a lot of livestock farms have wheat in the rotation specifically so that they can have an opportunity for manure management. And then on dairy farms after corn silage and often with a cover crop. This is uh, information that, that was um, presented in Ontario by Scott Shear a couple of years ago. And I found it extremely interesting because if we do application in the non-growing season, often when the weather conditions are poor, soil conditions are wet, we get a lot of compaction. And Scott presented some information that, that looked at what, of the, what percentage of the area is trafficked. And then in those, if, if you've got a, in this example, 45% of the area that has wheel traffic on it because of manure application, and you get a six bushel yield difference where you've got normal, uh, normal field conditions versus trafficked area, or you've got wet conditions where you've got a 27 bushel loss, then 27 bushel loss on 45% of the field gives you a, a, gives a pretty big economic incentive for applying at a different season. So if, if you have wheat in the rotation, the opportunity for cover crops and manure at a time when you're not causing that compaction, then that goes a long way in paying for having a crop that maybe doesn't yield as high or doesn't give as, as high an economic return. So there's more than just economic return in looking at management of, of different crops in the rotation. The other one, and this is, this is not related to crop rotation so much, but it's valuing the resource. So we've got manure in the storage and I'm using this example of a finisher hog manure one year open pit and, and approximately 
million imperial gallons or one point uh, one and a half million gallons US. So at capacity, based on just regular manure analysis or average manure analysis, I've got an awful lot of nitrogen. So if I use that as a, as a source as urea and then the phosphorus and as MAP and then potash, I've got in that storage about $71,000 of crop available NPK plus micro nutrients and organic matter, which isn't accounted for in this number. So it's, it's a huge amount. And, and so the question is, how would these nutrients be managed if they were purchased at egg retail, if they weren't manure? And do all the fields that these nutrients are being applied to actually need the nutrients? And I'm gonna come back to that one in a few minutes. The other one, same type of storage, but how long would it take to pay for covered storage? If we took the rainfall out of that storage, we could save about $4,000 a year just by having a more concentrated nitrogen, uh, not having to transport the water because it's, it's, it's expensive to, to transport water if you've got a, a uh, manure that's at 1% or 2% or 3% dry matter, you're spending a lot of time spreading water to the field. So can we, can we look for opportunities where we cover storages? And that might be harder for lagoons than it is for, for some of the concrete storages. But on a per year basis, looking at, at um, um, how many days of storage, uh, if you covered it, you would have 500 days instead of just a year. Your nutrients are more concentrated. And so you're saving money on a couple of different fronts. So just looking at, is there a way that we can reduce the amount of water that we're transporting to the field? Uh, in our area, there's some interest in liquid solid separation, um, separating out, especially in dairy manure. If you've got something that's at the 8% dry matter, can you use a screw press or some type of a separation system so that you get the solids at 60% plus? And then if you've got high fertility levels, it also makes it easier to broker that manure to a neighboring crop farm and it, it maximizes the economics of the storage. And then the liquids that are remaining can be applied to, to um, fields during the summer, either through um, some type of, well, I guess irrigation is not an option, but, but uh, to forage fields or fields that need the water that time of year. Manure on wheat, uh, we did some studies and with dairy manure and with most of the manures that have a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio, the recommendation two thirds manure, one third fertilizer, we did see a big difference, and not big difference, but we did see a difference in the protein where we applied manure, we had higher protein. Um, and if we had pig manure, uh, tended to work better than, than a dairy manure that had a 8% dry matter. The, the, the lower the dry matter, the, um, the better the results, but also the higher the application rate. Right time, right place. Uh, Glenn's gonna talk about that, so I'm not gonna cover that. Manure on forages, that's a big one in Ontario. I think almost every dairy farm applies, man or most dairy farms apply manure after at least one of the cuts. In the area I live in, there's often three or four cuts of, of um, forage. So if the weather conditions aren't right after first cut, we get a rain um, or, or whatever, then then there's the opportunity to go in after second cut or third cut. And sometimes farmers will go in after they do a haylage cut as opposed to a hay cut, just because the, the, uh, the hay is down a little bit longer. They can't get back to the field quite as quickly. So why apply manure to forages? Uh, application timing is a big one. Nutrients to growing crops is, is, is beneficial. Those crops can use the nutrients so it, it prevents the environmental losses. It applies the phosphorus and potash specifically that the crop has removed. And I don't think farmers realize in Ontario at least how much potash is removed from a forage crop. If we don't, if we're not careful, we don't apply the potash, we can lose up to 35 parts per million of potash just in one rotation from, from alfalfa. We can save on commercial fertilizer dollars. It, it reduces the storage requirements if we can empty that storage in the summer, spreads out the workload, reduces compaction, and it gives about a 10 to 15% yield and quality increase. And that's something that we uh, did some studies on um, over a number of years and saw that, that there was an increase in, in quality if we 
put the yield and the quality information into the milk program, um, there was a, a, a pretty big difference in how much milk would be produced on those forages. The ideal application rate between three and 4,000 gallons, basically you don't want to apply more than 50 pounds of nitrogen and ammonium form. And it also provides sulfur, which in our area is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. And it's, it's always a good idea to have an analysis at the time of application so that you know, know what kind of a credit you can expect. The key with manure application on forages is to try and get to the field before you get any kind of regrowth. Because if you've got regrowth, you're damaging the crowns and, and you've got new regrowth that has to happen at, at the crown. We did some ammonia loss measurements on forages for several years and looked at the difference between shallow injection versus surface application. And what we noticed consistently is that the biggest application or the biggest nitrogen loss is right at the beginning. The higher the pH of the manure, the quicker that loss. Um, and the higher the application rate, if there was any kind of ponding um, on the field, that would be where the application losses were the highest. And what we did is we took the sometimer tubes, uh, we put them under pails, the pails had holes in them, and we would go in and look at those desometer tube readings uh, every day, or sometimes at the beginning, uh, twice a day, just to get an idea. Manure and cover crops, uh, I know that Melissa's gonna talk about this, uh, so I'm not gonna spend much time on it, but some of the questions in Ontario with cover crops is which cover crops work best with manure? Um, oilseed radish is one, oats is one that have been really good in Ontario so far. Manure, another question, manure ahead of the cover crops or do you apply the manure after the cover crop has started to grow? To grow? And, and then the other one, how can, we, how can we seed the cover crop and do the manure application in one pass? Um, slurry seeding is, is one option. People have been trying air seeders or, or other kinds of, of methods to try and get that seed mixed in into the profile, but not too deep with um, cover crop planting and manure application. Another one that's being tried in Ontario, strip till. Um, so after soybeans come off or after corn comes off, if it's early enough, uh, some farms will go in and they will, they will do a strip, put the manure into that strip, or they'll put cover crops in that strip. Um, and then the opportunity to, to plant into that strip in the spring. It's still new. Um, there's not a lot of people doing it yet, but there's a lot of interest. And um, as soon as farmers start thinking about that they want to do a practice, they'll figure out a way to, uh, to make it happen. The synergy is the part that I'm really interested in. I, it, this is on the um, left side, cover crops with no manure. Um, on this side, cover crops that did have manure. And, you notice that there's a lot more roots, there's a lot more biomass. And this is the field that those cover crops came when in. Um, you can see, it's pretty easy to see where the manure was applied versus where uh, it, there was no manure. Um, huge difference in, in that biomass. And we basically, where we had oats or we, where we had the mixtures, um, we, we had about two thirds difference, or not, sorry, not two thirds. Th uh, we had 33% uh, increase in, in the biomass. What we found out though is that if you've got manure being applied, it's probably not economical to have a whole bunch of different species because you're going to get the few species that are dominant and that are going to grow and, and probably shade out some of those other species. So far that's been our, our observation. And then one that I really wanted to just uh, spend a minute on, we did for several years in a row um, oats by itself and oats with uh, anaerobic digestate, dairy from a dairy farm. Um, and we had, we did a, a lot of sampling. So we had just with the oat cover crop, um, just over two and a half tons per acre um, with the cover crops and the organic matter, almost four and a half tons per acre. Um, when we put that into the, the milk, the Wisconsin milk program, um, we did have more milk production and and so what, what I think is kind of cool here is a lot of people will say, yeah, cover crops, that it just costs me money. But in this case, if you've got a crop that you can harvest afterwards and you've still got the roots that are adding to the organic matter and you're preventing nutrients from moving off the field into the environment and we're increasing the amount of, of milk production, 
then it makes it a, an economic advantage to have those cover crops in that rotation. And then the other thing that, that I thought is if you've got this much feed value for cattle, what is that feed value for the microorganisms in the soil if you return all that carbon back to the soil? Then the other thing that we did is, is we did take the um, quality measurements. And so looking at it in a different way, if we only applied digestate to, uh, no, I guess the question that we were looking at is how long would it take with each of these practices to increase my soil organic matter by 1%. And so if I did only digestate, it would take about 200 applications to increase the, the soil organic matter by 1%. If I did only cover crop oats, it would take about 26 crops to increase the organic matter by 1%. If I have the cover crops and the digestate, then it's about 15 times to increase organic matter by 1%. So there is that synergy in combining cover crops and feeding those cover crops and feeding the microorganisms in the soil. It's just a, a cool way to look at cover crops from a, a little bit more economic perspective. The other one that, that I just wanted to spend a bit of time on is selling manure. Um, we've got in, in our area, some areas where there's a lot of livestock farms. So there's not a lot of cash crop neighbors really close by or neighbors where you can, can um, take manure to. But, in every area you've got cash crop farms without livestock. If I've got fields that have really high fertility levels versus fields with low fertility levels and I apply swine manure, let's say finisher manure because I like the numbers. Um, if I apply the NPK, then because my phosphorus and my potash are already so high, it's gonna take years and years before that phosphorus is contributing to any nutrient value for the crop. So it's really only the nitrogen and maybe a little bit of the, the phosphorus or, or potash that's contributing to, to any economic value. Where if I've got a field that needs those nutrients that have a relatively low soil test, then I'm making use of the full nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, I'm getting much more value for, for those manure nutrients. And so if I sell manure to, to a livestock, or sorry, to a cash crop farm, then I see those dollars immediately instead of waiting 10, 20, 30 years for the soil fertility levels to go down so that they actually need the nutrients. Um, some people will sell manure to neighbors. Some people will trade uh, land where they'll grow corn for a neighbor or hay for a neighbor and, um, and then put manure on, on their farm. So there's different ways to do this, but it's a, a way of, of distributing the manure so that you're not contributing to higher soil test levels and higher potential losses to the environment. And, and basically this is saying the same thing. It, it's it's um, moving manure from areas of high fertility to low fertility, um, looking at some, some um, I guess uh, regulations or methods through municipalities that make it easier to do that. So for example, instead of transporting on the road, is the, the, the opportunity to have some pipelines that go to the center of a, of a block and then be able to, to um, drag hose or tanker from that spot. So there's different things that, that are being considered and looked at. So in summary, um, manure and organic matters prevent, uh, provide nutrients, they prevent, pre prevent pre they provide soil organic matter and so value to improving the soil. A four hour approach, right time, right place, right rate and right, um, right source are gonna provide the most economical nutrient utilization and minimize the environmental risk of contamination. Um, that four hour approach with application to growing crops during the growing season is also going to prevent nutrient loss to water sources. I guess the other thing to, to keep in mind, maximum value doesn't always mean maximum nutrients. Sometimes there's a compromise to nitrogen or, or to a full utilization of every nutrient um, in, in exchange for labor or soil quality or other farm priorities that priorities on, on some of the farms uh, result in different management practices and, and really that no farms are exactly the same. So that's a, that's a really quick overview. Um, but if anybody has any questions. Um, 
haven't seen any questions yet, Christine. If they pop up, we'll uh, we'll get those to you to answer. Or at the very end, when uh, when everybody's done speaking, we can maybe have time if you're able to stick around. Um, we can we can answer a few then as well. So sounds good. Uh, looks like Glenn is up next. Thanks, Christine. And Glenn Arnold will be our next speaker. He is. Uh, He's an associate professor at the Ohio State University College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, and he is the manure nutrient management field specialist for OSU Extension. So, Glenn, thanks for being on, and special thanks for Glenn for uh, helping helping us water quality associates with this program. He had a lot to do with it as well. So, all right, Jordan, can you hear me? We can hear you, and. I don't think I got my screen share working quite right yet. Right now we see your desktop. Yeah, that's not a good start. What do you got now? Uh, we have, there you go. We're good. Hey, that sounds good. Let me change my uh, pointer for just a minute. Okay. And do a laser. Oh, okay, great. Appreciate the opportunity to be with everyone today. Uh, we're going to kind of go over some of the research that we do in Ohio, some of the strategies that we use to get manure on fields at the right time. Of course, the Western Lake Erie Basin with the Maumee River that goes through Toledo has certainly been a high topic for, for um, a long time around here. Um, I guess I always look at this graph from Hutterberg College, and all I want you to know is this is a graph that shows the amount of free phosphorus or dissolved phosphorus that's in the Maumee River as it goes into to, uh, Lake Erie. And there are four watersheds that are graphed on here. And the only thing I really want you to see on the four watersheds is just this general horseshoe shape. Starting about 1994, for whatever reason, the amount of free phosphorus or dissolved phosphorus uh, that's entering uh, Lake Erie has gone up. Now this is fairly old data, this is 2014, but those numbers are still very high. So the question is, or the, the thing we need to do is we need to react and, and work toward this. And everybody does, not just livestock, not just crops, but everyone needs to look at to how we can uh, take care of this issue. As Christine talked about, we really emphasize the four R's too. I work primarily with manure, but we try to put it on at the right time so it can be used. The application of manure uh, and consistency across the field is not a big deal for many, many farmers. I mean, they're nearly professional manure applicators themselves, but this is simply a drag hose situation where manure was coated on a field around a facility. And it basically shows how consistent and even an application like that can be. But this is also probably done in the fall after crops have been harvested. I surveyed producers a number of years ago, and there are some additional um, um, articles that have been published on this, but I've estimated that when you take your silage off in September, we probably apply somewhere between 50 and 70% of our manure after crops have been harvested in the uh, state of Ohio. So as wheat acreage has declined, we've shifted our manure application window to the fall, just as the commercial applicators have shifted their window to the fall. And our dairy manure is primarily stored in outdoor ponds. Our hogs, our manure is primarily stored underneath the pit, stays a lot more concentrated, we don't get diluted with water like we do the outside. And also in recent years, even the uh, Beef industry, as you look at the newer facilities that have been built in Northwest Ohio, even the beef industry is moving more toward liquid manure. When I do look at a manure analysis, I'm not really sure how to get that little thing off my screen that's there in the road, but if we look at a manure analysis, um, we always, this is a swine example, and this is pounds per thousand gallons, but I always look at the first two buttons, or the first two numbers on this, and that is that this swine finishing manure example has 37.68 total pounds of nitrogen in a thousand gallons. And of that total nitrogen, almost all of it, 35.97 is in the ammonium form. So it's readily available for a crop to uptake or it could be lost if applied to ground that doesn't have any growing crops. This example also has a small amount of organic nitrogen had this been a dairy manure example, I would expect the total nitrogen to be less 
and the organic nitrogen portion to come up higher. Then we have another number, which is our K2O, excuse me, P2O5. Most swine samples, even though this says 12.36 pounds per thousand gallons, I would expect in the state of Ohio, we're closer to 20 on pounds of P2O5 and a thousand gallons of swine manure. And this is our K2O, 29.87. And those forms are the very same form that you buy dry commercial fertilizer in. So a pound of this is equivalent to a pound of of dry commercial fertilizer uh, after you've taken out the uh, carry, carrier ingredients and things. If I can get a two parts uh, nitrogen per one part of um, phosphorus in my manure samples, those make very good side dress manures for liquid corn or for liquid side dress of corn. Because over the course of a two year corn soybean rotation, Roughly, we're going to need 200 pounds of nitrogen for the corn crop, and we're going to remove about 100 to 125 pounds of P2O5 with the two crop harvests. So if I can get that two to one, then every other year in a two um, or every third year in a corn soybean rotation, I can side dress my corn and not grow my P2O5 numbers at all. The other thing I emphasize is that in these liquid manures, if you just quickly look at the value, at least 40 to 45% of the total value of the N, P, and K in that manure is in that ammonium nitrogen form. So that's a pretty big chunk. You know, if, as Christine mentioned that, you know, um, you have a million gallons of hog manure and you have a value on it, just remember that 40 to 50% of that is in that ammonium nitrogen in uh, swine finishing manure. So if you can use it, you've really got something going. We started many years ago, probably going back almost 15, um, where we started doing side dress plots with manure with a very small tanker. You can see where the wheel location is on the tanker. So soil compaction is not much of an issue in these small plots. The data that we came up with over a five year period of time with three kind of tough growing seasons and uh, one sensational growing season but what it showed us is simply that the, the top half of this chart is pre-emergent manure application, which means I came in uh, right after the corn was planted and put all my manure on. Here's my 5,000 gallons of swine incorporated finishing manure, surface applied 5,000 gallons, incorporated dairy manure at 13,500, surface applied dairy manure. And then I came back at V3 on some other parts of the field and did the very same plots. But the point we're wanting to make is that um, we did these pre-emergent plots thinking, you know, we had to get our mineral on before the corn was up, if we ever wanted to go to a drag hose. As you look across, uh, we ended up with a uh, neat data from a standpoint that we were able to get, uh, we were able to get more than, um, oops, more than 15 bushels per acre on those pre-emergent plots where the incorporated swine manure beat the incorporated 28%. On the post-emergent plots where the corn was in the V3, we had similar good results. And kind of keep an eye on that 18.6. We're going to bring that up a little bit later. When we just put the manure on the surface as a nitrogen source and did not incorporate it, made no effort to conserve the nitrogen, we pretty much gave back the advantages that we had. Some years it was pretty close, some years it wasn't, depending on what kind of moisture we got right after planting or right after the mineral application. But even when we incorporated the, the uh, dairy manure, uh, we got similar results that we did with the swine manure. Now in these instances, the dairy manure we had to spike with 28% UAN because dairy manure by itself didn't give us our 200 units of nitrogen that we wanted to side dress plant their fields at a 45 degree angle to make the hose easy to drag. You don't need a second person in the field to manage the hose with you. And in this instance, we've dropped the uh, injector unit out of the center row and ran one and a half to both sides of the center row to get the adequate nitrogen we want. And we run one and a half to both outer rows because we're going to put a guest row between each, uh, each strip, just like a, a 28 applicator would do. And they've worked with us since 2014. And if we looked at 
data from Dark County from 2014. When we look at the years of 2019 down to 2014, a six year average, they've run um, right at 200 and uh, 200 bushels per acre on their side dress plot and 183 on the commercial fertilizer. And for that instance, that's a 17.3 bushel. And that's really, really similar to that 18.6 that we had gotten in our small plot data. And if we compare it to what the Herons thought it was worth through that time period, because they're putting their N, their P and their K all, all together, they're not having to buy any commercial fertilizer. And they thought it was worth from the yield increase in the price of corn, about $157 an acre for them. Now they don't do all 2000 acres of corn this way. They, they pick one field that's gonna be near their finisher buildings that needs the P and the K, and then they'll make the application. So it's just important to realize we set up a particular field in advance, so we do this right. The other thing we look at is the balance. Uh, we look at trying to um, see what our nutrient excess or, or, or deficiency might be. So in this example, if we figured a 200 bushel corn crop and we figured this is a removal rate of P2O5 for corn and, and potash. This is soybeans at 65 bushel. This is a removal rate of uh, P2O5 and K2O for soybeans. We removed 70 pounds of P2O5 and 51 pounds of P2O5 over a two year period of time. So we remove 121. And when the Herods come in and put their 6,500 gallons per acre of swine finishing manure on, they're getting their nitrogen they want for the corn crop and they're putting about 117 pounds of P2O5 on. So they're actually, if you look at that, running a deficit on their P2O5, which is exactly what they want. Their fields are all in a maintenance range. They're pretty happy about that. K2O, you know, do the same math for those numbers. They run a little bit on the excess, but still very, very acceptable. Um, they're very pleased with uh, the rotation that they have set up with this. Now the units we've been running are colder till, and this is a VTI unit, which is very similar, but here we have a, a uh, wavy colder that's running ahead of a boot that's placing the manure onto the soil. And then you've got a pair of closing units that are gonna try to cover manure over top that. In no-till situations, you're probably not gonna get very good coverage. So you're counting on your manure to trickle down in to the soil on these colder tills. But all three of our toolbars are indeed colder till units that we use. Now I'd mentioned that the Harrods plant at the 45 degree angle with their fields. This is a field that's been, that's a square 40, but it's been planted at a 45 degree angle here. And this is just like what I had mentioned that Harrods do. And you can see where the applicator is side dressing corn going back and forth on here. And when he eventually gets done with the left hand side, he'll swing over do what they call a bow tie maneuver or a hose maneuver, bring the hose over to the right hand side. And eventually the time will come that the field's completely planted. You can see that it's at a 45 degree angle, the planting, you can see the field tile from a very wet, nasty growing season as this gets started. Um, but it just shows you kind of what we uh, run with. And we have several farmers that like this very much. And we have other farmers who said they'd be a cold day, you know, where before they would adopt something like this. So the other second method that we've used is to put the hose along the edge of the field and then put a hose humper on the edge of the field and allow the hose humper to uh, move the hose as we go back and forth or up and down the field, depending on how the field's planted. But in this example, the hose humper is on the edge of the field. And as the applicator goes back and forth, way down here is the hog building. You can see we've got the road blocked off with a couple of pickup trucks and then the hose humper guy is waiting for this applicator to come down and make the turn. And that's worked out real well for us as well. Uh, again, you can see the guest of the skip row that we've put in with this setup. Sometimes we don't do that depending on the farmer and themselves. The third way we've gone about this is to put the hose humper tractor in the center of the field. And we've done this for quarter mile fields and we've done this for half mile fields. This field is gonna go from where this hose is here all the way to these barns back here. So this is a pretty long um, 
a large area that we're going to cover this with this one. In this field here, I'll just show you a short video. This is a hose that's going out to the field. This is a mainline hose, we call it. Usually about a six or an eight inch diameter hose, although we've got some guys as big as 12 inch hoses now uh, that are running these hoses out. This is a soybean field the farmer owns. He put the, the hose on top of the edge of the soybeans. And then they'll have a drag hose, which is a little bit smaller. Using most of our drag hoses, they're five and a half to six inches in diameter. That drag hose will go out into the corn field. Everything here is corn. And way down there at the top was the applicator that's running across the field. The hose humper's taking a break, shooting the bull with somebody who wants to see how this is being done. And here we are moseying along. Now, we're not having a guest row in here. This application rate today is 5,000 gallons per acre. We've got the hose humper guy who's waiting for the tractor to go past. That'll pull this hose out of his road. And then he will simply keep bringing the hose across the field to keep it where the hose humper wants it or where the applicator wants it. This applicator wants this hose behind him. So the weight is behind him so he can hold his line and go. And with the auto steer today that we've got, uh, with the expertise people are getting better at, you can see how we're doing. Again, we have a colder till, a manure unit injecting into the soil, and then we have our covering wheels. And this is a system that uh, we have been covering. We got almost a thousand acres done last year with three of these 12 row units because the soil stayed dry, field conditions were dry, corn grew fairly slowly in uh, late May and, and early June. So we had a, probably an additional two weeks to work this year that we haven't usually experienced. If we do this, we know that we can do corn up to the V4 stage without any problem. So this first leaf out of the ground was the V1 leaf. This next leaf has a collar here around the plant. It's gripping the plant, that's the V2 leaf. This corn plant is gripping the, the stalk, that's a V3. And then this leaf has not yet developed a collar. So this is V3 corn. When this last one develops a collar, that will be V4 corn. We can do V4 corn, but we prefer to do V3 or V2 corn if possible. The firm seed bed, this you can see is kind of a no-till situation. That's also really good if you get the ground too soft. Uh, these hoses are very heavy. They certainly will uh, uh, drag soil, make it difficult to go. Now in a perfect world, we think our next logical step is to look at this Catman system. And this is basically a hard hose system and we're not driving across the corn with the hose. We're staying between the corn rows. And the way this works, this system is gonna go down the field and as it approaches the other end, it's going to, you can see the hose is being rolled up this is a solid hose. They're pumping about 1,200 to 1,400 gallons a minute through it. The pump is back off to the left-hand side where you can't see it. And when he turns, you can see he's gonna fold up that wing. This tractor driver is gonna pull forward to stay where he wants to be. And then he's simply gonna pick the next 16 rows of corn to travel down. Again, with auto steer, at about this point, he'll be hitting his button to uh, line the tractor up on. And then this hose will stay directly behind the tractor as they travel down the field. This gentleman here is gonna release things a little bit and let him go. And they can do easily quarter mile fields or a little bit more. This is a new silver version that Cadman has developed. It's a lot less expensive than their original system was. One of the great advantages of this is the size of the corn. Um, where I said we were limited to V4 corn, this field here is about V7 to V8, and they're having no problem whatsoever. As long as you can drive your tractor down through the corn, um, you can run this type of toolbar through. And when it gets to the opposite end, it'll simply turn uh, and start coming back again. And then the uh, applicator who's sitting on the tractor with the large reel hose he will also simply uh, start to pull the hose back in when this guy makes the turn and he's ready to go. This was a system that uh, was developed by the Alec brothers down in uh, Mercer County in Ohio. 
Um, they've got one of their units and we're trying to get one up here in the watershed because again, primarily we think this would give us a much wider window of manure application opportunity. And we think that this is a much more acceptable system to farmers who don't want their corn flattened with a, a drag hose. So again, we, we really think this is a system we wanna to go toward. It seems like the ne next logical step for us someday. And uh, we kind of have our fingers crossed. We keep, keep checking with a couple of sources on the possibility. Again, you can put whatever injector units you want on here. This one happens to be running an airway today, but you could put the Dietrich sweeps on there. You could put the uh, rolling quarter uh, rolling quarter chill systems on here. You just have, have to get whatever system you think you want to have. And in summary, what we're looking at is we want to use the manure fertilizer to grow crops. It's another tool in the toolbox that people can use. You always need to remember you're going to apply that manure regardless. As we ask you to take it to fields that are further from the farm, as we ask you to take it to fields that need the P and K, um, that's gonna be more costly to get that manure greater distances. We have a lot of people that are putting out frack tanks and hauling manure with semis. And um, if we can capture this nitrogen, then we can help pay to move this manure a greater distance. Because again, we've been able to replace all your purchase 28 by just using the liquid manure. So the other thing we're trying to do is capture nitrogen that have been wasted since we evolved to the liquid systems. Your dry systems that we came from, you know, ammonia is water soluble. So the ammonium nitrogen in manure in a bed pack pretty much leaves. So because we have these liquid systems where the manure hits the water and then the ammonium gets absorbed, that's why we have the amount of nitrogen we do in the ammonium nitrogen or in the liquid manure. So we want to apply the P and K to actively growing crops so, so we can get some uptake. Uh, we want to integrate liquid manure into modern crop production. So we call that using nutrients at the right place, right time, and the right amount. We try to put a lot of our stuff on Facebook. So if you happen to be a Facebook user, you can go to Ohio State Extension Environmental Manure Management, and uh, we try to post uh, videos, uh, plot results, things like that throughout the year. And with that, Jordan, that pretty much completes what I wanted to cover today. All right, thanks, Glenn. Uh, appreciate the, the presentation on side dressing. And if anybody on the call has interest in uh, trying one of these systems out in the next spring or so, you can get a hold of Glenn or, or one of us on the water quality team. Uh, next up, uh, let's see if we have any. We do have one question here, Glenn, we can answer quick. He said, um, do you have any ideas of getting eight row units? Um, at this point, we are, aren't, aren't really looking at an eight row unit. Um, we are looking at the possible, if we get a cabinet, we are thinking of going to a 16 row unit. Um, but, you know, an eight row unit would certainly work. Just the person would just need to, to um, probably drive a little faster than what we're currently doing because of the manure pumping and stuff. But, but right now we've got just 12 row units. Okay, thank you. Um, next up, um, we have Dr. Melissa Wilson. She's an assistant professor and extension specialist at the University of Minnesota. Her research and extension programs focus on manure, nutrient management and water quality. So thanks for uh, being with us, Melissa. We can see your presentation. Great. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of our research at the University of Minnesota, trying to integrate manure and cover crops. In Minnesota, most of our manure goes on during the fall application season, and we typically recommend applying once soil temperatures are cool to try to preserve some of those nutrients. And our soils probably get a little cooler than they do down, down here in Ohio. Um, but that's one of our main recommendations. On the other hand, we have a lot more people starting to grow cover crops. And usually you don't want to um, apply your manure and then uh, do your cover crops because then you're not going to have very many growing degree days to get those cover crops. So that kind of it gets to the point where we want to get the cover crops on early, but we want to apply the manure late. And a lot of people had concerns about digging up the cover crops and would they um, still work once they're kind of disturbed. 
with them in our application. So that's what we've been working on. I wanna talk a little bit about two different projects here. We have two recent studies. One is where we waited until after uh, harvest and we were able to drill cover crops and then we applied manure into them. And that kind of led us to thinking about how can we get even more growth on our cover crops? Can we interseed them into standing crops and then do the manure application later in the fall? So I'm gonna talk about this first study here. In this one, you can see all of our locations. We had a lot of on-farm sites, a couple of places where we had small research plots as well. And we did different dairy types. We did dairy manures in the red and blue here. And we also did swine manures in these lighter colored yellow stars. And a couple of different rotations, continuous corn, whether it was corn silage. We also did the corn soybean rotation where a lot of the swine manure and some of the dairy manure tended to go in as well. And the idea was we wanted to get these cover crops established after silage harvest because the corn was coming off a little early or soybean. So that way we had a little bit of time for cover crops to get growing. Uh, gave them at least two weeks in most cases, maybe more in others. And then we applied the manure and we used some sort of injection system. The following spring, the rye was terminated about two weeks prior to planting the next corn crop. We measured soil nitrate in the top two feet, and then we monitored yield for the crop after this to see if the cover crop and manure had any kind of impact on the yield. And at each place, we had places where cover crops were applied and places where cover crops were not applied. So that way we can compare the actual cover crop aspect. And then this is on over two site years, 2016 and 2017. I think we had about 17 to 19 sites over the two years. So one of the things we found out pretty quickly is that the earlier you get your cover crops established, the likely you are to get better biomass in the spring. And that's what we see here. We have rye planting date, and then we have spring biomass, which was about two weeks prior to planting. And you can see the trend is that the later planting date, and here's the actual dates in case you don't know what Julian dates are, uh, the later you got it planted, particularly into mid to late October and November, the less biomass you got in the spring. In fact, under the conditions in Minnesota, for each week you delayed planting your cover crop, you lost about 330 pounds of biomass. And that's important because if you're trying to protect water quality, you want as much biomass as possible. So a couple lessons learned. I think the practical aspects were some of the big lessons that we learned in this particular study. And because a lot of this is on farm, we you know, allowed people to use their equipment that they had available to them. So this is a deep shank application system. So basically it really rips up the soil. You can see we had cover crops planted here, but right after injection, it looked like there was barely any cover crops there. And the following spring, you know, rise pretty hardy. It did come back, especially from far away. You can see the cover crop looked okay, but up close, you can see that it was actually pretty sparse. Um, so, you know, there's still some results, but still not great. Versus double discs, these are becoming more and more popular in Minnesota. It's essentially some a form of surface application where it drops manure onto the soil in a line and then these double discs throw soil up on top of it. And again, after application, you can see it's pretty aggressive in between those discs where it's throwing the soil up and there wasn't as much um, rye growth there, but in between the discs where there wasn't soil disturbance looked pretty good. And we saw that again in the spring. And what was interesting was about that is that, you know, maybe we don't need to have 100% coverage to really slow down water erosion or wind erosion or whatever it may be. Maybe having these strips in the field is okay. Something, you know, probably needs to be evaluated in the future. But really our best case scenario was knife injection. In this case, um, it looks pretty rough during apple or when it was actually being applied, but just two weeks after injection, a lot of the, the cover crop was coming back pretty quickly. And then the following spring, it hardly looked like a manure applicator had been through there at all. It looked really good. So in this case, um, minimal disturbance is going to be really important when you're injecting manure into a growing cover crop. Here's just a picture of that system out of the ground. 
you have an opening straight coulter and then we had some narrow sweeps and these don't have the bars in them that would help like roll the soil off the top of it. It kind of just opens up a pocket where the manure can be applied and then sets the soil back down. Of course, it depends on, you know, soil moisture conditions and things like that too, but this seemed to minimize disturbance. And just looking at some of the results from that study, here we have soil nitrate in the top two feet. This is about the time that the cover crop was killed in the spring, so a couple of weeks before planting. The green bars show you where a cover crop was. The yellow bars show you where there was no cover crop in that same field. And we have differences between central and southern Minnesota. In southern Minnesota, the cover crops did tend to be larger. There's more growing degree days. So there was less soil nitrate to where there was bigger cover crops. But what was interesting was, you know, averaged across all sites, regardless of whether it was central or southern Minnesota, it was about 200 pounds of soil nitrate was left in the soil where there was not a cover crop. Here you can see average over both locations. Where there was a cover crop, there's about 123 pounds of nitrate in, underneath those fields. Where there was no cover crop, it was 202. So that's about an 80 pound difference. And again, that's really important for soil um, and water quality issues. I don't know when the biggest loss periods are in Ohio, but in Minnesota, we see our biggest nutrient losses in the spring during snow melt and when that um, soil is thawing because you don't usually have a crop growing there. So if there's a big rain event at this point, um, you can conserve a lot of nitrogen. It's going to be kind of stuck in that rye crop. So that's you know, pretty good indicator of helping to protect water quality. People always ask us about yield too, because there's always concern about the rye potentially um, causing some yield reduction. And I just wanted to show you the sites here. Again, the green bars are where there was a cover crop, yellow bars are where there was no. And in each site, there was at least three strips with a cover crop and three strips without. So these are averaged over those strips. And in some cases, you can see the yields actually were better where there was a cover crop. And in other cases, the yields were lower where there was a cover crop. But when we take the average over all of these sites, we see that the yields are actually really similar, 197.5 bushels per acre versus 199.4. So not statistically different, which is one of the important lessons that we like to point out. Some years are gonna be hits and some years are gonna be misses. The cover crops can be beneficial in some years, and maybe not as beneficial in other years. But on average, over the long term, um, you'll kind of even out the, your yields. Big take home messages from that study are plant cover crops as soon as possible. And that kind of led us into our second study. And that e injection equipment matters. If people are gonna start doing this, they need to consider what kind of equipment they have and what uh, adjustments they can make to make sure that they're minimizing the disturbance to the soil surface where the seed is. So that ended about the time I was coming on board in Minnesota. I started there in uh, summer 2017 and wanted to continue some of that work. And we decided to try that interseeding. Can we get these cover crops grown early? So you can see some of these pictures here where we actually have it with the standing crop. And we're trying it in a bunch of different rotations. Up at Morris, we have small plots where we're doing a continuous silage corn and soybean corn rotation. We have two on-farm locations where we're using strip till to get the manure applied into cover crops. And then we have small plots in Waseca, Minnesota, where we're doing a sweet corn corn rotation and so soybean corn. And I'm gonna focus on these two at this Waseca site just to kind of keep um, moving Otherwise, I would inundate you and talk forever. So just to kind of quickly cover our methods for our sweet corn corn. Sweet corn comes off early, mid-August, so we're able to drill cover crops after that. And we tried three different cover crops. We tried rye only because rye has smaller growth in the fall but can really grow in the spring. The, we tried oats. Oats have a lot more growth in the fall, but they winter kill and then don't grow in the spring. And then we had a mixture of the two, and we also threw some turnips in there as well to get that kind of combination of good early fall growth. Those crops die, but then the rye takes over and can take up nutrients in the spring. And then to compare it to a standard practice, we had no cover crop. 
Then since we were able to get that cover crop established really early, we wanted to try two different manure application timings early and late. As I mentioned before in Minnesota, we recommend waiting until soil temperatures are cool below 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit to slow down the microbes that would convert nitrate to leachable forms or to convert nitrogen in general to leachable forms. And the idea was, so if people want to apply manure earlier, could they use a cover crop to help capture some of those nutrients that might be converted into the leachable forms? So we had an early manure application, which is late September. Soil temperatures were still pretty warm at that point um, in the high 60s, I believe. And then we did a late manure application when soil temperatures were pretty cool. And to compare that to the standard practice, we did a spring fertilizer. One thing that I want to mention is we did not apply full nitrogen rates of manure. We backed off by about 40 pounds, and then we applied that 40 pounds at planting with commercial fertilizers, kind of as a starter fertilizer. Soybeans was very similar, but it was a smaller study. Um, one, the soybeans tend to not do well with really early interseeded crops. So we overseeded winter rye at leaf drop um, to try to capture the leaves dropping on top of the seed to help hold some of the moisture so the seeds could germinate. And then we did some drilling after some of the crop came off to compare it to what we had done in the previous study. And then we had the no cover crop section. And because soybeans tend to come off later than sweet corn does, we only were able to apply manure at that late timing. And then we had the spring fertilizer to compare that to. And again, we use what we had learned from the first study and we chose an application system very similar to what worked best in that we have Dietrich sweeps here, again, opening coulter, the Dietrich sweeps that pick up the soil. And as I mentioned, it really depends on soil conditions too. You can see that there's are some big clods that are kind of forming here as we're going through the soil, but notice that they're not going the 30 inches. Um, these are set on 30 inch centers. So we're not seeing the soil kind of being thrown up over that entire width and that will help the cover crop continue to grow. Just to show you some of the biomass um, here where we had fertilizer, so this is spring fertilizer, so it wouldn't have damaged the cover crop. In that case, the cover crop um, was a lot bigger in the fall than where we applied manure, which can be expected. Uh, here we have our rye cover crop in the sweet corn, our oat cover crop, and our mix. And in general, the mix was more damaged by the manure application than the other ones were. Uh, notice these bars here. There's these big error bars that show that there is quite a bit of variability in this study. So some of that had to do with the soil conditions in different parts of the field. In our soybean corn rotation, notice I have the biomass from 0 to 500 on both of these scales. And the biomass was not very big in the soybean corn rotation. Being able to drill and get that really good seed to soil contact early in the growing season in August is really beneficial to getting good cover crops. In this case, we overseeded in September and drilled after harvest. And you can see we did not get very, uh, hardly any biomass for the drilled. There was something there, but it wasn't you know, big enough to even cut and try to measure. In this case, we did see a bit of a late manure um, hit. The manure application did decrease the biomass a little bit in the soybeans as well. By spring, however, our oats died, which is expected. We expected them to winter kill. And we saw that in the rye, the manure really benefited the rye growth. Um, so it kind of made up for killing the rye a little bit in the fall and then getting those extra nutrients improved growth when we applied manure compared to where there was just spring applied fertilizer. And again, these were taken about two weeks prior to planting right before we killed the cover crop. The rye was seeded at a lower rate in the mix, so it's not surprising that it was a little bit lower in biomass production. We're going from zero to 1200 pounds per acre of biomass now. In the soybeans, we did increase our biomass as well from the fall, but it was still a lot smaller than we saw when we had were able to drill the cover crop in August in the other plots. 
And again, we saw a yield kind of hit or a yield bump with the late manure for our cover crop biomass. And again, this is rye. Our drilled, we still, we had an issue. That particular fall had been really wet. So we think that those conditions going into a hard freeze in the winter just did not help the small, tiny cover crop that was growing. So unfortunately, we didn't see much going on with our drilled in that case. Uh, quickly covering some of the growing season issues um, in their sweet corn plots, we really started seeing some early differences in our corn. You can kind of see the waviness. Some corn is bigger, some corn is smaller. And here's an example later in the growing season, here where we had uh, oats and early manure applied versus oats and the spring fertilizer. Um, you can see how yellow these bottom leaves are. They're dead and dying. You can see in this leaf here, it's starting to fire where basically the plant is trying to take nitrogen from the plant because it can't get it from the soil. And it's moving it from its lower leaves up to the higher leaves where photosynthesis is occurring. And that's why we see the yellowing starting from the midrib because that's where it's you know, translocating the nitrogen first. Versus where we had spring fertilizer, we're not seeing nearly as much firing. A lot more of the lower leaves are still green um, versus this other one. So we even had these kind of visual differences. And here is our corn yield. So this is green yield after sweet corn um, for both of these. And what was interesting is that we thought that there might be an impact of fertilizer and cover crop kind of mixed together, but we actually didn't find that. Um, regardless of what cover crop was planted, uh, the yields would behave the same whether it was fertilizer, early manure, or late manure. And same with cover crops. It didn't matter what nutrient was applied, the cover crops still behave the same as well. So what was very interesting was these nutrient results. With our spring fertilizer, which is our standard practice in the region, we yielded 230 bushels per acre. It's a pretty good yield for this location. Early manure, however, um, yielded less, significantly less, 217 bushels per acre. Notice that I have some letters up on top of these bars. If the letters are different than one another, there is a statistical difference in yield. And then you see our late manure actually yielded significantly higher, almost 34 bushels per acre um, than the fertilizer even. We think we just had really conducive conditions for mineralization from the manure this year, that it was supplying additional nitrogen uh, beyond what just the soil was and then what was applied in fertilizers too. So we were pretty pleased to see that um, the late manure did so well. I was surprised that the early manure did so poorly um, you can see the difference between early manure and late manure. It really, really shows that late manure is the way to go if you're trying to conserve your nutrients, waiting until those soil temperatures are cool. With our cover crop, the big takeaway message here is that anywhere there is a rye, so here is rye and then mix had rye in it too, cover crops significantly reduced yield compared to no cover crop or the oat cover crop. Again, oat winter kills, rye continues to grow in the spring and has the potential to tie up nitrogen. And we think that's what happened. Um, we still have to look at our soil samples that we collected to see if there was any differences in nitrogen content. And then here are our yields following soybean. In this case, we did not find any differences between fertilizer and manure. And the effect of cover crop was very similar to what we found in the sweet corn rotation. Anything that had rye in it, which was both overseeded and drilled, tended to reduce yield. Even though we got very, very low uh, cover crop in the drilled plots, it still seemed to have an issue with tying up nitrogen for the little amount that was there compared to where we have none. Uh, none yielded 245 on average, whereas uh, anything that had rye in it yielded 233, which is still a good yield. It just didn't yield quite as well as the standard practice. So that is all I have. Here are my funding sources for this project. Follow me on Twitter. Um, if you're interested in seeing some of our other research projects going on, we got side dressing going on. Um, I ran into Glenn's research a few years ago and he inspired me to try it in Minnesota as well. So you can check out some of that research as well at z.umn.edu slash research. 
And with that, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, again, if you have questions, please get those typed into the chat or the Q&A. Um, and we will uh, get those out to you. I think all our panelists are still on. Um, uh, if you could stop sharing, Melissa, I'm going to put up our slides for our, our next upcoming webinars. It looks like there's, excuse me, a question in the chat from Melissa from Ryan. Ryan Fritz, can you see that chat, Melissa, or do you want me to read it out? I'm not seeing one. Oh, sorry, in the chat? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we are seeing that in some cases, the rye does seem to kind of tie up that nitrogen for a little longer. Some of the research we've seen is that if you keep up with cover crops, particularly rye, for at least like five to six years, that's when you're starting to see those benefits of that. It's finally starting to release more regularly because you've kind of built up that organic matter. Um, but it, it usually when you're doing it for one or two years, um, it does seem to really tie up that nitrogen at first. You have to kind of build up the system. And then are there some questions too? Yes. Looks please. like there's a few more in the chat. Um, one from Garrett, uh, Garrett Hearn. It says, question for all, are there any studies on solid layer manure applied followed by liquid cattle manure applied to the same field? Advantages and disadvantages mixing the two? I would think you just wanna keep an eye on your uh, P205 levels with multiple manure applications, but I would not see any reason that you couldn't put both liquid and solid on a field. I wouldn't see any difficulties except the, the potentially the, you get a lot of phos, uh, phosphorus build up in the soil pretty quickly. There's a question there from Dale Overly that says, are there any studies being done pertaining to pathogen transfer in animals? Uh, yes, Wisconsin's done some work, um, and you can you can take a disease like Yoni's. If uh, if a dairy farm has a Yoni's disease, you put that on alfalfa, then you cut that alfalfa and feed that to uh, small dairy animals. Uh, yes, you can you can get a transfer of Yoni's. We generally are in Ohio discourage the use of uh, of dairy manure on alfalfa if that's an issue. Now, if the manure is applied immediately after cutting, where it's going to have a full 30 days in the field, you know, that's different than splattering manure on the field a week before you harvest. So, but there is a concern. Yonis is, is one of at least one that I've seen in the literature. And I, I know we've cited that in an article in one of the beef newsletters in Ohio a year or two ago. So pathogen transfer is certainly a concern on forage crops. Yeah, we, we, recommend, we recommend that manure gets applied immediately after harvest because otherwise you get a lot of, of crown damage. But yonis, um, if yonis is an issue or even generally we recommend that manure not be applied on hay that's going for young cattle or for heifers. And uh, manure that's been ensiled has less chance of yonis transfer than, um, than in hay. And then the other thing, um, if manure is applied and the forage is being um, harvested as baleage or wrapped hay, um, there you tend to get longer forage strands. And so if you've got some bad bacteria, you can get uh, butyric acid instead of lactic acid. And so you get some bad spots in that hay. Um, so generally we don't, we don't recommend it on fields that are going to be used for baleage either. I guess just one other comment that ultraviolet light really helps to reduce pathogens. So summer application is generally not nearly as much of an issue as if it's cold and wet in winter type conditions. 
Melissa, did you want to add anything there? So you're done muted. I was just going to add the similar thing with horses. If you're applying horse manure on pasture, we usually recommend keeping the animals off of that particular pasture for three to four weeks afterwards. Um, doesn't look like there's any more questions at this time. If you guys have questions, feel free to, to reach out to the presenters. I think they provided their um, contact information or to one of us on the water quality team or a local extension agent. Uh, I want to thank everybody that um, all the attendees that uh, uh, we appreciate everybody uh, coming on today. So look forward to the, uh, the next water quality Wednesdays showing up there in February. And the QR code that is on the screen is for CCA credit. So um, make sure you take a picture of that and uh, I'll leave it up here for a minute or so. Thank you. Thanks all. Jordan, you'll collect all these names. I saw several people asking about the CLM credits. You'll submit these names to Sam Ball under ODA, correct? Yes, yeah, so we're going to take the list of attendees and send them uh, send them all into to Sam. And he said he would go through the list and um, figure out who needed CLM credits and go from there. So, thanks for your help on getting both those set up. Uh, really appreciate that. Yeah, Glenn, I have access to reports for attendees and registrants after the fact. Okay. Should be able to go through those. Yeah, if, if Glenn or Christine or Melissa, if you need numbers from people that attended or anything like that, um, send me an email. We can get all that information to you guys. Thanks, we'll do. I'm sure, you know, Ohio State Extension is similar to Minnesota Extension. They love to know how many people we reached. <laughs> all right folks christine hey. great to see you. melissa great to see you again today as well yep you as always glenn we'll that have to chat about pretty good. side dressing here soon <laughs> well if we ever do get a cadman system you can bet we'll we'll uh Try to get some data with it. They're yeah. made in Ontario, Glenn. You need it in Ontario? I said they, they were made in Ontario. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the only thing that prevents me from stealing one and dragging it down here is getting across the border. Do they, are they going to have one to demo at the Menor Expo? I'm positive they will. It's a nice system. It really is. It's something I think is the next step for us if we could get a hold of one. Um, the, the silver version that they had here, uh, that I have the video of, is uh, the price tag is two hundred fifty-five thousand for that, and that may sound like a lot, but that's a lot less than the six hundred thousand that went with their original version. I think we're starting to see custom applicators more interested in it because it extends the number of days that they can do application during the season.